When you start to question Elon Musk's Starship claims, it doesn't take very long at all to get flooded with angry comments referring to historical figures like the Wright brothers or Henry Ford. Imagine where we'd be if all those great men listened to the naysayers, they cry. But then they make the mistake of comparing Musk's vision of Mars to Christopher Columbus's discovery of the New World. Fanboys line up to chide people who don't equate Musk's desire to colonize Mars with Columbus's bold trek across the Atlantic looking for the spice route to India. And the saddest part is, they think this is a direct comparison. Well, since this episode is going to delve into living conditions and dangers aboard a starship while en route to Mars, we thought we'd kill two birds with one stone and destroy the false Columbus equivalents once and for all. In 1492, when Colombo launched the Pinta, Nina, and Santa Maria into the Atlantic to sail over the western horizon, he never had to leave Earth. Although the route to his destination was unknown, his crew never left our atmosphere. So they never had to worry about breathing air. Gravity continued to affect them. Sunshine continued to light their way and keep them warm. Solar radiation might, at worst, give them a bad sunburn while providing them with vitamin D, but they didn't have to worry about instantly freezing to death when they stepped outside or having their body liquids boil off if they tore their clothes. Fresh water fell from the sky. If the ship caught a leak from hitting something, the whole ship didn't suffer explosive decompression. If the leak was too bad or if the ship caught fire, they could abandon ship in lifeboats or jump overboard. And then there were two other ships traveling in their convoy, so one of them could stop and pick up the stranded sailors out of the sea. If a sailor was out of reach, he could swim over to his rescuers. None of the above is true en route to Mars. From a supply side, the typical foods brought on these long journeys consisted of water, vinegar, wine, molasses, honey, cheese, rice, almonds, salted flour, sea biscuits, dry legumes, salted and barreled sardines, dry salt cod, and cured beef and pork. Sailors also brought a variety of domesticated animals with them, including pigs and chickens. But everything the Martians bring with them will be in freeze-dried packages, and that's going to add up to a lot of stinky plastic waste. You think they're going to dump it all into space? One of the smallest things one might overlook was the availability of salt, sea salt, sodium chloride. Without this simple compound, human life ceases to function. Salt is crucial to human muscle and nerve function as well as maintaining fluid balance. Hyponatremia is a condition brought about by low sodium intake, which starts off as headaches, leads to swelling of the brain, seizures, and coma, and eventually can wind up resulting in death. Salt and pepper shakers are absent on the ISS because the powders cannot be dispensed on food in space. Those particles can wind up free-floating in the cabin, getting into eyes, ears, and electronic equipment. Now just for fun, let's go down a list of some of the things that Columbus's sailors could do that Musk's Martians will never be able to do again after they leave Earth. Breathe fresh air. Enjoy the sunshine on their skin. Walk or run around on the deck. Work and exercise in normal gravity. Go swimming in the sea. Bathe. Collect rainwater if their water at sea runs low. Net fish, collect seaweed, and shoot birds if they became short on food. Bring domesticated animals with them for food, milk, or eggs. Oh, and have sex. We'll come back to that one. So that covers what Columbus's guys were able to do while they were en route to the New World. Now we're going to take a look at what they'd be able to do after they'd arrived. Importantly, they would have been able to eat the food they found after they foraged, including plants they'd never seen before, such as avocados, pineapples, peppers, corn, and potatoes. They could drink the fresh water. They could even dig new wells. They could fix their boats with wood and pitch. They could plant crops, hunt meat, breed and repopulate their own livestock, build shelters, furniture, and tools using local resources. On the social side, the sailors could interact with the natives. They could conduct trade with them. They could even mate. Whereas male travelers to Mars will probably have to abandon their sex drive due to cardiovascular concerns. Not only does blood pool higher in the body in space, but the human heart shrinks like every other muscle. So for the entire way to Mars, the men might be feeling a little bit like our friend here. This scene from The Expanse looks great. 
but it's not going to happen. Whether or not this gets any better after they land on Mars remains to be seen. When it got cold, the sailors could light a fire. Think about that. Martians can't bring fire to Mars. On a planet where the average temperature is minus 60 Celsius, if your heater breaks down, you cannot light a fire to stay warm. There's nothing to burn, and there's no oxygen in the Martian atmosphere. So one of man's very first discoveries will have to be abandoned on Earth. Columbus's crew could also collect and store the resources they were going to need to get back home when they were ready to put at sea. Without an agriculture complex, Martians headed back to Earth will require a supply drop before they can even think about taking off. And probably most importantly of all, if they encountered trouble at sea, whether going home or on their initial voyage abroad, they could turn around. But once a starship is headed home, their departure port starts moving further and further away, making it near impossible to return to safe harbor in case of an emergency. That pretty much covers the conditions and experiences of the Columbus crew. Part 2 is going to look at the conditions Musk's Martians can look forward to. Let's see how that will manifest itself amongst the crew members, starting with breathing fresh air. The last breath of fresh air Martian colonists will enjoy will be the one they take before they enter Starship's payload compartment. Once that exterior hatch is sealed, Every breath they take for the rest of their lives will be recycled, filtered, stale air. And on the ISS, according to Commander Scott Kelly, that air smells like prison. An accumulating combination of body odor, antiseptic, and decomposing garbage. On the positive side, traveling in space can also cause people to lose their senses of smell and taste, so they won't actually know how ripe their stench is. Which brings us to bathing, or rather not bathing. There are no bathtubs in space, just as there are no showers on the ISS and no flush toilets. When their funk gets out of control, these 100 people will have to resort to what we call a sink shower, a wet face cloth or other sanitary wipe to remove the day's worth of dirt and sweat from their skin. That's another thing they won't be able to do in space, sweat like a normal person. Without gravity to pull it down or away, sweat stays stuck to skin like a film until you wipe it away. And that's particularly concerning while exercising, as they will be required to do for a minimum of two hours per day. Without the mandated exercise, astronauts on simple one-week missions have lost as much as 20% of their muscle mass. And upon entering weightlessness, bodies immediately begin to shed bone calcium at a rate of 1% per month, causing worsening osteoporosis. The calcium that is shed through the urine can accumulate in the kidneys and form stones, causing anything from mild discomfort to severe sharp pain. On a multi-year mission, how serious these accumulating effects become can only be speculated upon, but let's just say the Martians are not going to arrive on Mars in peak physical condition. Chris Hadfield spent four months in space and spent over one year in recovery afterwards trying to build back his bone density and his muscle structure. His counterpart, Scott Kelly, experienced an even worse diagnosis after almost a year in space, which had the potential to leave him permanently crippled. He required extensive physical rehab once he returned to Earth and Earth's gravity with top doctors and PT professionals. One of the medical topics you'll almost never hear discussed regarding space travel is what effect it may have on dormant viruses and other serious medical concerns that reside in human bodies just waiting for the right conditions to manifest themselves. Even the simplest things, such as rashes, due to the breakdown of the microbiome we all have on our skin that keeps it healthy. Since showers and baths are out of the question, the most often used method of cleaning off is with antibacterial wipes and dry shampoo, which are harmful to that layer. And rashes can also be caused by other irritants or allergens found on board the spacecraft. Chicken pox is caused by a virus that lays in wait in spinal cells to manifest itself as shingles later in life, which makes an ordinary rash pale by comparison. Bubbling, pus-filled blisters that typically wrap around the torso can also affect the face and even attack the eyes. Herpes or cold sore viruses are also ever present, waiting for the opportunity to break out in and around the mouth, making meals a miserable experience. Moving down the throat, mononucleosis is caused by the Epstein-Barr virus, and in its worst form, mono can constrict the throat to the point where it is completely closed, making it impossible to eat, drink, or even breathe in worst case scenarios. Symptoms of fever, fatigue, and body aches can linger for upwards of six months. And the same virus is associated with chronic fatigue syndrome, Hodgkin's lymphoma, 
gastric cancer, nasal pharyngeal cancer, inflamed bowels, MS, and Burkitt's lymphoma. So you get the idea. You've got bugs in your system you don't even know about that can cause anything from rashes to cancer. And they've all got one thing in common. They're waiting for a weakened immune system to break out. The best ways to compromise an immune system? Poor diet, dehydration, lack of exercise, and stress. Another possible ignition source for these infections is cosmic radiation. And at the 2016 Guadalajara conference, this is what Elon Musk had to say about GCRs. But you didn't touch much on how you will keep humans safe. Yeah, my view on the radiation thing is that there's certainly some risk of radiation. It's not deadly. Um, there will be some slight increased risk of, uh, of, of cancer. So I actually think the radiation thing is, is, is um, it's often brought up, but I think it's not, not uh, too big of a deal. So apparently, Elon Musk knows something about cosmic galactic rays that has eluded every actual expert on the topic, including those working at NASA, ESA, and the Canadian Space Agency, who all believe radiation is one of the greatest threats that astronauts will face. See, humans haven't actually been outside the Van Allen belt surrounding Earth since we last went to the moon. And since our astronauts on board the ISS are protected by these magnetic bands, the assumption seems to be that they're all fine, so the Martians will be as well. But that is definitely not the case. The ISS in LEO at 230 miles sits comfortably inside the inner belt that starts at 1,000 miles away from Earth, or about 1,600 kilometers. The outer belt extends to at least 25,000 miles away, or about 40,000 kilometers. Further, astronauts like Scott Kelly do experience damage from radiation, especially to their DNA. As this last frame states, he is still not 100%, and the damage didn't start recovering until he returned to Earth. General effects of radiation on a human body, destruction of DNA and tissue, increasing chances of cancer, decreased red cell counts, and decreased lymphocyte production, resulting in a weakened immune response, which is just what you need when your body is trying to shake a bad case of shingles or mono. In 1991, the first experiment in a facility called Biosphere 2 began. Eight people, four women and four men, entered the research facility and were to be sealed in for two years. The results of that experiment remain controversial, mainly due to the sociological ramifications and fallout of having eight people locked up together for that period of time. Despite sharing a facility with over three acres, just over a hectare, worth a variety of ecosystems, these eight people still managed to become so disconnected from each other that they formed into two warring factions that had absolutely nothing to do with each other due to an ongoing struggle for power. Even after the experiment was over, these two groups never spoke again. Adding to their anxieties were the failures of several aspects of their mission. The crops did not produce as expected. The pollinating insects died off. The plants did not scrub enough carbon dioxide out of the air, and this often resulted in oxygen levels dropping as low as 14.5%. The low crop yield meant the biospherians had to eat their own seed stock, leaving them nothing to plant for the next cycle. And they burned through a hidden emergency food cache, which completely negated the experiment, already being criticized for allowing persons to leave who were injured, and for pumping in extra oxygen to make the air breathable again. All of these failures contributed to declining morale, which would also have affected the mental health and social relationships. This was on Earth, in Arizona, in an engineered microcosm of nature that was as close to perfect as the builders could make it during four years of construction. They brought in 3,000 species of plants and animals. The biospherians had animals to care for. They had daily chores. They had a rainforest to walk through. They even had a living coral reef to scuba dive in. And these eight people couldn't make it two years without social discord and scandal. So Musk wants to cram 100 people into a space measuring about 400 cubic meters after ops and storage decks are removed from the equation for a minimum of a three-year return trip. There is a reason why NASA has created their minimum habitable volume per traveler guidelines, and it is so that everyone has their own personal space with a little room to breathe. However, if Musk convinces 100 people to travel on a single starship, each person will only have about 4 cubic meters to themselves, which is not enough room to stretch your arms out without clipping your roommate in the head. And when you've had enough of each other, there's really nowhere for you to go. 
In fact, they will have less personal space per person than is required for the treadmills the ship must have or the space needed to don an EVA suit. On Starship, they will have housing decks, each deck with eight semi-private quarters holding 32 people, the gallery deck, which would also hold about 32 people at a time, same as the quarters deck, and the exercise deck, where the Martians will do a compulsory two hours of exercise daily, then remove themselves from the area so others can use the gear 24 hours a day. With nine to 10 exercise stations occupying a deck the size of a small one-bedroom apartment, there's not going to be much room for socializing or movie nights. Flight deck and ops will be off limits, as will the storage bay, so they will sleep, eat, work out, and repeat. For fun, they can stare out the provided porthole at the void of space, but don't count on the orchestral concerts that Musk promised you in the atrium. Mars has a reputation for breaking engineers' hearts. To date, only 40% of the craft that have been launched towards the Red Planet have actually managed to land successfully. It looks easy enough, relatively flat geography, no toxic clouds, and almost no atmosphere. In fact, the atmosphere is so thin, parachutes are almost ineffective for landing even the smallest craft. The parachute on the Curiosity rover was 150 feet wide, or about 50 meters across, and even that wasn't enough to guarantee a soft landing. The latest rover delivery system, such as the one deploying from Earth later this summer to deliver Perseverance, interfaces with the atmosphere, which is too thin for air breaking, but thick enough to cause heating, so it requires a heat shield. After the lander passes through the outer atmosphere, next step is losing the heat shield, and then the back shell after radar collection determines a suitable landing zone. Once the lander is separated from the clamshell, it is up to retro rockets to lower it most of the way to the ground, and that's when a four-point sky crane lowers it gently to the surface in an ideal spot. The biggest reason for the retro rocket crane is to avoid blasting a crater into the very fine, toxic, abrasive regolith, which is the exact opposite of what Starship proposes to do. That dust cloud is never going to settle. And when the Martian colonists open the hatch on Starship that sits 100 feet in the air, waiting for the cable crane to lower them to the ground, they will all be weak, brittle, and immunocompromised as they have to begin construction of habitats to live in and the fuel depot they absolutely need to build to make their way home. Coming back to comparing this to Columbus's adventures, let's sum it up. The sailors that signed up with Columbus did so with a medieval fear of falling off the edge of the earth if they sailed too far. They had to put up with crappy salted food, cramped conditions, seasickness, scurvy, leaky ships, bad weather, oceanic storm surges, rats, roaches, and a host of unknown factors waiting for them in the new world. One month into the voyage, having not seen land since they left, conditions were so bad that the crew began speaking of mutiny. And this still would have been a walk in the park compared to what Musk's million Martians will be signing up for. Thanks for watching this episode of the Common Sense Skeptic. We look at all the comments you make and we take the suggestions for your upcoming episodes under consideration. As we approach 1,000 subscribers in our first month, we would love your assistance getting the word out either by sharing this video with your friends or joining our Facebook group to keep the discussions going. Thank you for your continued support and be sure to keep an eye out for the next episode of The Common Sense Skeptic.